Okay. Okay. Well, thank good. you, Mr. Whitsitt. Uh, and thank you all for the uh, invite to come and talk. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about the uh, what I've titled an American story. Pompano's Jewish pioneers. Uh, we're going to start not here in Pompano, but uh, way back in time to see how uh, this story really progressed over the years and the centuries. Uh, most of the people, the majority of Jewish residents of the United States trace their heritage back to Eastern Europe. Uh, the question is, how, how did the Eastern European Jews get to Pompano, yeah. get to the United States, yeah. and then to Pompano? Well, the story starts uh, quite a few centuries ago with the fall of the Roman Empire, if that's not going back too far, uh, we find that after the, the fall of the Romans, there were Jewish people scattered throughout the empire from England to uh, what is today Russia and Turkey and elsewhere. Uh, but by the Middle Ages, many of the Christian kingdoms and, uh, and the monarchs began to, to uh, feel that the Jews in their uh, in their kingdoms were not uh, reliable, uh, probably reliable in the sense that they would do whatever the king wanted them to do. So, uh, beginning by the, by the beginning of the uh, of the 14th century, you begin to see England and France and Spain and and many other European countries. Uh, expel the Jews and they were scattered throughout uh, uh, the eastern part of Europe where they were uh, moved uh, without uh, without uh, having to having to uh, bow down to the local king. Uh, in fact, in Eastern Europe, in some areas, the Jews uh, constitute the majority of the population in, in some areas. And much of this area was in Russia, uh, which had been expanding its borders westward, taking in areas in which the uh, Jewish population had, uh, had uh, settled. Uh, areas that are now Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, parts of Poland, and Lithuania uh, came under the Tsar. Now, Russia had, ex had itself excluded Jews since the 15th century, uh, but found itself with a large Jewish population within its new empire. Uh, the solution was what is was called the Pale of Settlement, and thus also giving rise to the saying beyond the Pale. Uh, this was an area in Western Russia where Jews were permitted uh, permanent residence, not as equal citizens. Uh, and by 19th century, in this area that uh, that's up here, everybody, everybody can see it. <laughs> okay. I have to check with our technology expert. Uh, this light green area was where Jews were allowed to settle within the Russian Empire. And in fact, by the end of the 19th century, nearly one half of the Jewish population of the world lived in this area. Uh, life for the Jews in Russia and even in the Pale began to deteriorate following the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. I'm gonna get the Tsar up there in his final moments. Uh, he was, he had survived several assassination attempts, uh, all of them except the last one, uh, when they blew up his, his uh, carriage. Uh, the Jews didn't have anything to do with this, but they were handy scapegoats and uh, began to uh, be persecuted because of it. Uh, this led to a series of pogroms 
These were attacks on Jewish uh, settlements with widespread looting, rapes, and murders. It wasn't a genocide in the sense that they were trying to, that the Russians were trying to uh, wipe out the Jewish population as, as happened uh, with the, in World War II, but rather to sort of cow them and uh, keep them from becoming too, uh, too prosperous. Very similar, you might say, to uh, if you've been watching the stories of the Tulsa massacre in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, when the black community was attacked and I don't know if I forget how many, but let's say hundreds of people were killed, but not the whole population and things eventually went back to semi-normal. Uh, this, uh, over this period, the last part of the 19th century, there was an increase in discriminatory laws and restrictions in Russia. And it, by the early 20th century, the uh, pogroms uh, became the official policy of the government to use them to, to uh, often to sort of take the uh, population's view away from who was actually causing trouble and blaming it on the Jews. Uh, by 1905, the, these attacks reached their zenith, and uh, not surprisingly led to a general flight out of, uh, out of the Russian settlements in the Pale. And when I say settlements, they were some big, big cities as well. Uh, the United States was the number one uh, destination for these people. Interestingly, the second most, uh, the second uh, most uh, destination was South Africa, uh, and there was also a, a number of uh, Jews from the, the settlements uh, from the Pale that went to uh, Palestine as well, starting the whole Zionist movement at that time. But the United States was uh, the primary destination for. Uh, these people. The United States, one thing going forward, it had virtually open borders. There was no federal law until 1881 regarding immigration. You just showed up and walked off the boat, and if no one told you you couldn't do it, uh, you were... The first, uh, it, the first immigration law in the United States by the United States government was in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, where Chinese were prohibited from entering the United States. In 1891, uh, immigration law in the United States was passed that barred immigration for polygamists. Makes sense. Uh, people were convicted of certain crimes, but they had to be pretty bad crimes. And the sick are diseased, although this was generally limited to to diseases that no one really had a cure for and were communicable. Uh, the following year in January of, 19, of, 18, 1892, uh, Ellis Island was opened as the receiving station for the city of, uh, at the city of New York. And by 1907, just 15 years later, it was handling over a million immigrants every year. So this is the story of one of those Jewish Russian families and its role in the establishment of the Pompano Beach Jewish community. Pompano's first uh, Jewish res uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, Pompano's first Jewish resident arrived in 1928, or at least the first one that we know of that stayed. Uh, the records are kind of hard to decipher before that time, but uh, uh, Abraham Isaac Abe Hirschman, who immigrated under the name of Ezek Hirschman, spelling uh, spelling Hirschman differently, it's not in too much difference though. He was born in Minsk, Russia. This is the synagogue in Minsk. Uh, 
that was built in uh, the 19th century. Uh, Minsk uh, now is part of Belarus, one of the successor states. And he traveled to the United States, landing in Ellis Island on December 1908. So he, they got out while the getting was good. Records show that they sailed from Antwerp, Belgium, uh, aboard the Red Star Line ship uh, Samland. There's a, the refugees leaving, uh, artist uh, rendering of refugees leaving. A postcard from the Red Star Line from uh, promoting passage from Antwerp to America. And I think the next one is the actual ship they came over in, the Samland, who was part of the Red Star Line, kind of a interesting name for moving a lot of Russian uh, Russians out of uh, out of Russia. I think they changed their name after World War One to the White Star Line. Uh, now, back then, this was not, in spite of the fact that millions of people were coming to the United States, this was not just, a, a, you know, like getting in your car and driving up to Jacksonville or something like that. Passage from the United, from Europe to the United States cost about $30 a person on average in steerage. You know, you didn't get a, your own cabin or anything like that. Uh, that, that may not sound like much, but uh, in the United States at the time, a laborer made about $10 a week, and that's for a 60 hour week. So the Hirschman family with their kids were probably paying the equivalent of about a half a year's salary to just to get from Antwerp to New York City. And it's also a question of how they got from Minsk to Antwerp. And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, it probably, it, it very likely that uh, le there was a, a lot of shipping going out of uh, Latvia, which was just north of Minsk and some of the other areas where people came from. And they may have uh, gone by ship from Latvia to Antwerp rather than the uh, rather arduous uh, railroad or uh, well, that would be the only other real uh, way you could do it. Um, most likely, uh, the Hirschmans paid for their trip the way many people did, is by selling off everything they owned at home and then hitting the road. Uh, Abe's citizenship documents give his birth year in 1892 when he applied for citizenship, uh, which is interesting because his grave marker gives a birth date of, of 1920, 1890. Uh, but let me tell you, if you look at enough documents, you can justify a lot of different birth dates and a lot of different arrival dates and that sort of thing. Uh, at this time, when they arrived in the United States, the Hirschman family composed of the parents, and I'm using their Americanized names, Harry and Molly, and Abraham's siblings, Annie, Rose, Dora, and Morris. And they lived on uh, Lower East Side, yeah. They lived... Uh, they moved and lived on, uh, when, once they arrived in New York, on the uh, New York's Lower East Side, very trendy area today, not so trendy back then. Uh, this was, uh, uh, a lot of the immigrants lived here in the tenements, and um, uh, mostly at this time, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, was uh, contained newly arrived Jewish families. You go ahead with the next one. Just to give you an idea of 
There's a street in the Lower East Side. Probably all got wine bars in it today, but <laughs> one more, I think. Another shot of the Lower East Side. Uh, keep that image in mind because, because I mean, interesting contrast. Uh, times were tough. Living space was limited, and perhaps Abe was ready to strike out on his own or was encouraged to strike out on his own. But for whatever reason, sometimes thereafter, he left New York City for Nashville, Tennessee to live with relatives. Once away from home, he entered the mercantile business and later moved farther south to St. Augustine, Florida, where he worked as a traveling salesman and met Lena Carniol, a divorcee who was born in 1894 in Bialystok, Russia, but now part of Poland, uh, and immigrated to the United States through Baltimore in 1910. In 1928, Abe once again moved southward to Pompano, at that time, a small farming town with a population of about 2,500 uh, uh, residents. Uh, perhaps he was tra he had traveled down this way before in his sales as a salesman, uh, but he obviously saw the possibilities uh, for a, a, an experienced businessman in Pompano. Almost everybody was a farmer, so they had to buy from somebody. Might as well be him. Uh, he soon opened the Bonton Dry Goods Store on Northeast First Street, on the same block as today the Bailey Hotel and the uh, Bank of Pompano. The store sold a variety of items. Many old timers remember buying their annual pair of shoes there. Uh, Abe sent for Lena and her son Herman, and in 1932, they were married in Fort Pierce. This picture of the downtown is actually uh, probably about 20, maybe as much as 20 years after Abe arrived, but to show you uh, just that his store would have been somewhere around here. We don't have a good photograph of that particular store, um, but you can see, compare that with uh, the Lower East Side in terms of how proud. This is probably a busy day in downtown Pompano at that time. Uh, meanwhile, Abe's younger brother, Morris, who was born in 1903, and his wife, Gertrude, better known as Goldie, uh, who was born in 1907, were living with his widowed mother-in-law, Sarah Rubenstein, uh, in a Jewish neighborhood in Queens, New York. They got out of the Lower East Side or, or skipped it entirely. Although Goldie had been born in the United States, her mother was like, was like the Hirschmans, a Russian immigrant, having arrived in 1905. But in the mid 1930s, Goldie, their young daughter Irene, and their young daughter Irene, Mo, I'm sorry, Mo, Goldie, and their young daughter Irene uh, left, left New York for Pompano. A second daughter, Mona, would be born in Pompano. In this, uh, those two that uh, just moved back and forth, the one was taken in New York, I think, and the other one was, you can see, you're down in sunny Florida. Uh, the two, Irene, Irene and her parents. Uh, in 1935, Mo purchased the Bowder Pharmacy on Northeast First Street and one of the storefronts of the Bailey Hotel. Um, he would rename the business the Pompano Pharmacy, uh, a name that would be used for over eight decades. The two Hirschman families found Pompano to be a benign place to call home. There was little, oh, there was little overt anti-Semitism and certainly no organized opposition to them. Ross Carniel, who came to Pompano from Boston during the Second World War as a bride of Herman, remembers being warmly welcomed into the small Southern community. This is a picture of, whoops, Mo Hirschman, his wife, Goldie, Abe Hirschman and his wife, Lena. 
obviously a little bit later than when they first arrived. I think that I think that was in Miami. I think Irene said it was at the uh, some nightclub in Miami. This is probably after the kids left the house. <laughs> then you can afford to go out. Um, Here's a picture of this is Herman Corneal, uh, Lena's son and Abe's stepson. And it might as well go into the next one. This one obviously is not a historic shot. No. This is uh, Roz Carniel, and she played an important role out at the uh, farmer's market and her two daughters. Although she hasn't aged that much over the years. So <laughs> a, this is as good as a historic show photograph. Anyway, um, I was saying that there was, there was little overt uh, anti-Semitism in Pompano, and perhaps it was just not enough people to to uh, be worried about. But that wasn't always the case in uh, Broward County. During the 1930s, Fort Lauderdale increasingly acquired reputation as an anti-Semitic town. Uh, many hotels were restricted, uh, forcing Jewish travelers and tourists to go south to hotels in Hollywood, which was much more welcoming and the Miami area. Some Jewish residents left Fort Lauderdale because of the hatefulness. I know one person, I don't know uh, anybody in the audience, a man by the name of Leonard Robbins, who was uh, grew up in Pompano and uh, Jewish. And uh, uh, after World War II, he moved to Hollywood instead of coming back to Fort Lauderdale because he had such bad memories of the place. Um, Pompano's Jewish population increased with the opening of the Pompano State Farmers Market in, in 1939. I think we've got one there of the the farmers market. 1939 revolutionized uh, agriculture in Pompano. Uh, at the same time that uh, revolutionized it, uh, also allowed during the depression, farmers to buy a lot more land because there were a lot of people losing their property because they couldn't pay the taxes. Uh, along with the expansion of agriculture and the new, uh, the new uh, farmer's market, the, uh, many brokers came to this area uh, during the season. Uh, and uh, uh, and many of them were Jewish. Uh, some and that's just uh, one office, but go ahead and do the next one. You can see uh, the other picture of brokers. This was uh, I don't know. Every single one of them was a broker, but but uh, there were a lot of them. Uh, when I was talking with Ross Carniel about that, she worked out at the farmer's market and encouraged uh, many of the brokers to settle here instead of going back and forth between up north. She said there was a, some hesitancy on their part at first because they didn't think there were enough Jewish people in town to kind of make them feel comfortable. But uh, her retort was, well, if you all start living here, that won't be the case. Uh, but in any case, whether it was the brokers or not, a lot of after World War II, we begin to see an increase not only in the population of South Florida and Pompano, but the Jewish population as a number of soldiers who were stationed in this area began to decide that they didn't want to go back to uh, Fritters, Alabama or uh, Lugnut, Michigan or whatever the the towns were or go back on the farm and and move to this area. Uh, by the mid 1940s or into the late 1940s, there were enough Jewish families in Pompano to establish a worship group, uh, which was called the Pompano Jewish Circle. Uh, it was actually formed in 1945. 
as both a social organization and a means to work towards a congregation with, the, with its own building in Pompano Beach. At that time, there was only in Northern or from Fort Lauderdale North, there was uh, Temple Emmanuel in, uh, which is the oldest synagogue in, uh, in Broward County and nothing north of that. So, uh, um, and it was reform, so there was no conservative uh, popula or, uh, synagogue. Uh, in 19, uh, the, the circle was a, a sort of a loose organization. They'd hold their meetings in people's homes and, uh, and sort of plot on how to move on to the next stage. And the next stage came in 1957 when the circle established T Temple Shalom. Originally, the, uh, and it's spelled S H O L O M. Originally, the idea was to spell it the traditional S H A L O M, but they had to change it because uh, another temple in Florida had already incorporated under that uh, more traditional spelling. Uh, it's first the the temple's first uh, high holy day services were held at Pompano Beach's first Methodist church. Uh, with no facilities of its own, the local Jewish congregation met in a variety of locations over the years, uh, including Pompano Beach Chamber of Commerce, uh, Pompano Beach High School, Pompano Beach Garden Center, and Pompano Beach Elementary School. Uh, Passover seders were held at an Italian restaurant. Uh, members of the circle embarked on a fundraising campaign to build a permanent home for its congregation. In addition to individual gifts, a good amount of money was raised from Gentiles uh, in the community at various public events, chapels and uh, uh, auctions and, and just parties. And on February 7th, 1960, ground was broken for Temple Shalom's permanent home. Construction was completed that same year in time for the high holidays. This is a picture of uh, the temple under construction. Uh, the temple was designed by Fort Lauderdale architect F. Lewis Wolf. Uh, you may be familiar with one of his other uh, at least one of his other uh, designs, and that's the Kennan building, the circular building uh, on uh, Oakland Park and Federal Highway that has a mural on the side. Uh, the co construction cost was about $100,000, and a mortgage was held by the Kester-owned Bank of Pompano. There were a lot of volunteer efforts in here, and one of the stories often told, but means it can be told again, is that uh, when they were bringing Phil in for this, uh, they had some women uh, who had young children and weren't, weren't working to come down to the site and make sure that they filled what they were, you know, if they ordered 100 dump truck loads full, that they got 100 dump truck loads full. Well, they probably got, uh, more than that, because when the diapers were uh, changed, uh, the uh, the dirty ones often went into the pile. So, but don't worry. They, <laughs> I think they're long gone by now. So throughout the years of Pompano's Jewish community, the two Hirschman families, Abe and uh, and Mose, played an ongoing leadership role. Prior to the building of Temple Shalom, uh, this is uh, Mo, uh, Mo Hirschman. And uh, let me just, this is a picture of Abe Hirschman with his granddaughter. There are not a lot of pictures of him. Somebody dropped the ball somewhere along the line. Uh, uh, prior, uh, anyway, prior to the building of Temple Shalom, uh, Abe Hirschman and his stepson, Herman Carniol, had served as the congregation's president, uh, as had Mo Hirschman. 
1961, Temple Shalom's first full year of operation in its new facility, Mo uh, Hirschman once again became president, a role that was filled in the years 1977 to 79 by his daughter, Irene Reddish, the temple's first female president. Of course, there were other families and individuals who contributed significantly to the establishment of the Jewish community in Pompano Beach, especially in the years after World War II. In the year, early years, however, Abe and Mo Hirschman and their families played the critical role. So we'll stop there. The story to be continued into the, the modern era, but there's a lot more people to deal with at that point. So anyway, I don't know what the can we ask questions? You can ask questions. So what do you attribute the anti-Semitism in some areas like Fort Lauderdale versus Papano and how would the church didn't seem to depict that? I don't know it, unless it was the fact that the tourism business that they were attracting people who expected, just like segregation, uh, racial segregation, expected to be housed in a hotel that was restricted, that didn't allow Jewish uh, uh, customers. Was anti-Semitism prevalent throughout the United States in general? Well, yeah. During the 1920s, it was particularly virulent. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan was uh, uh, was as opposed to Catholics and Jews as they were to blacks, and uh, so there was, you know, it, there's always there's always a market for finding scapegoats, and. Uh, I think that it's always, it may be not obvious, but sometimes hidden beneath the surface that if uh, uh, the opportunity arises and people aren't, people of goodwill aren't vigilant, that bad things can happen. Sure. How long did the Bound Town Dry Goods Store exist on Coast Street? I think the 19th. Was it they they changed they moved to a, a shoe store, they changed it to a shoe store across the street, did they not? Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking to uh, uh, Mo Hirschman's daughter Mona right now. The uh, um, I would say probably at least twenty years. Yeah. Well, twenty eight was when he arrived, so. Uh, if it went into the 58, okay, maybe three decades. 